Hello, friends, and welcome back to a new episode of Reality Check. Our time is dominated by the ephemeral and the trans and transient. The cultural deconstruction runs rampant, and the looming nihilism seems to engulf all meaning and existence itself. Yet the transcendent still manages to break through. So how can we conserve the real in a time of deconstruction? Modern cities are marked by a stark absence of beauty. Buildings, like modern fashion, are built to be functional, not beautiful. So the practical dominates over the contemplative. But beauty, be it natural beauty, such as a sunset, artificial beauty, such as painting or sculpture, or even human beauty, has always been a gateway to the transcendent, a rupture of the divine and an anchor of it. So today I'm joined by Dr. David Clayton, an internationally acclaimed artist, teacher, and published writer on sacred art, liturgy, and culture. His blog, The Way of Beauty, attracts thousands of readers, and he has been the founder of the Way of Beauty program, which has been taught for college credit, featured on television, and he has also written many books. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, David, we've had many a conversation about this already um, outside of the interview, but um, I think we n none of us really um, feels like you can stop learning about beauty. So um, you've been a scholar and an artist yourself, learning about beauty, making beauty, teaching beauty. And I feel that all of those go hand in hand, don't you think? Mm. And would you say that you're more of an artist or are you more of a teacher of beauty? Um, I think it's difficult to say that I'm more one than the other. I started off wanting to be an artist, uh, but I realized that I had to learn all about the things that you're describing in order to be a good artist. I, I was a, I'm a Catholic and I wanted to serve the church and I realized there was a gap. And when I started to learn about it and talk about it, uh, I found that I enjoyed doing that too. So I, I think the two go hand in hand, and I couldn't imagine doing one without the other at this point. I love both. <laughs> that, that 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 is a good thing. Um, <laughs> now, um, are, are you currently working on something artistic? Do you have a project at the moment? Yes, I am working on a book. I'm that is will present uh, a a suggested canon of imagery for the great feasts of the church in the liturgical year, mm -hmm. which I haven't seen in the for the Roman rite. So that's mm -hmm. what I want to do. You get books of that nature in for the Eastern rite, for the Byzantine churches, but I think we need something in the Roman rite. And so I am uh, doing the illustrations for that uh, and the research for the images uh, so that This can be a guide for families who might wish to uh, take the illustrations out, frame them and put them in their icon corner and then switch them out in the domestic church through the year. But also I'm hoping that artists and parishes might look to this for guidance as to if they're, if they're commissioning art, for example, uh, if they need help in, in that regard. Very nice. Yeah, it's a great idea. It's, um, I remember that you published another little book called The Little Oratory, if I remember this correctly. And um, at the end, there's an appendix of some icons that you painted and or that you um, that you wrote. Right. I can uh, icons. I think you write, not paint. Um, but um, yeah, one can take them out and actually frame them. So um, it, it's such a great idea because, you know, it, it also, you know, uh, just it gives makes the makes one's living space then more beautiful automatically. So. Very, very nice. Yeah, just say I don't mind. I don't mind uh, if you say that I paint icons. I don't think it demeans the the practice. Uh, it for me, it doesn't matter. But uh, but certainly, uh, yes, I create. Good to know. Those <laughs> Good to uh, know. Yeah. No, I've, I've I've been corrected so many times on this that now I'm. Oh, you know, I just well, kind of want to cover I, all of my bases. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. There's a, there's a history as to why that developed, but it, it I don't think it matters that much. I'm very happy to to say I'm an icon painter. <laughs> Very good. Um, David, there, there's there's a lot that I want to talk about um, with you today, um, mostly about beauty. I, I myself teach philosophy of art, so that's something that is pertinent to me and also very interesting. Um, but I think it's actually interesting to all of our lives. But I want to start with a little bit something a little bit more controversial. Um, and and I 
I found something um, that I want you to comment on, okay? So this is a little citation from a little book by Tom Wolf, um, who himself cites um, Arts Magazine um, from in an issue from 1970, where an artist named Lawrence Wiener typed up a work of art, and it reads thus. It reads, quote, number one, the artist may construct the piece. Number two, the piece may be fab fabricated. Number three, the piece need not be built. Each being equal and consistent with the intent of the artist, the decision as to condition rests with the receiver upon the occasion of receivership. End quote. Tom Wolf comments that this was the death of art. What are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so it's funny. I've been thinking about that a little bit. The the um... First of all, the statement, this need not be built, uh, you could argue that's the death of art because I would say art is something that you make. The, the traditional mm -hmm. idea is that uh, you actually create something. It do, it's not simply the idea. You manifest it in in the, in the matter. That that's, that that's where we get the word artisan or craftsman, which is really what an artist ought to be. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it, it is. It's saying it's purely the idea. The, the other comment I make, I, I I just find all of that a load of gobbledygook. I'm just going to say it it it's it really doesn't mean anything serious. I would say, and if, if this is the guidance that people get in art schools, and and it is sadly, uh, it's certainly the death of good art. I, I don't think you can ever kill man's natural desire to create and to imitate reality. I think that that. You know, I think it's natural to us, mm. uh, but if this, to the degree that this governs what people produce in art schools, it's certainly uh, a model, at the very least, for bad art. I would say. <laughs> very good. Yes. No. Indeed. Well. So let, let let's start. Let's let's take that then as our starting point. That um, art is not dead. I think that's a good starting point. And so um, I'll, let me tell you something from my experience um, in the classroom, okay? So with undergraduates, but I mean, all ages really, when you speak about art and philosophy of art, I've made the experience that every student is immediately engaged, okay? Much more than let's say, if you just read Cicero and you know you need to unlock the secrets of the text or the historical circumstance. When you talk about art, it seems that everybody really has their own opinion. And it seems that everybody has an opinion and is opinionated. Um, so it, it seems to me that we could say, well, beauty is contagious and it sparks debate. Um, has this been your experience? And why do you think that is? Yes, it has been my experience. I, I have a little uh, sort of picture in my mind of a, of a dinner, you know, your standard dinner party where you have eight people around the table, four couples, say, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, the, 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 the subject of art comes up. And, and what tends to happen is that you will have me arguing the traditional line you have somebody, very often those who studied art, and, and certainly those who studied at a modern university, who will push the modernist line and uh, will will be in favour of that quote that you, you gave us from Tom Wolfe. Um, and then other people who are listening to this discussion, and actually... They, they they tend to withdraw a little bit so they, because they would say, well, I don't really understand art. And But if you push them, say, well, what do you think? Express your opinions. Actually, they do have opinions. They have strong opinions. And they're wary about um, expressing them unless invited to do so because, on the whole, they like beautiful art. They want the, And if you present them with what is traditional and good and they don't feel they have to understand it or explain it that is what they like um and uh, i think that that uh, what you might call common sense of beauty which i think is natural to us just like the desire for god beauty is a sign of something greater and higher um and we respond to it naturally. I think that has to, you have to work pretty hard to educate that out of people. And universities today are designed, you know, are designed to do that. That's what they're trying to do. 
Mm-hmm. But um, even then, you can't erase it altogether. It, um, it takes a lot of hard work. But people respond to it because it's a sign of what we all desire, I think, happiness and, and the divine, and we're made to respond to it. Now, now let us then let, let let's let's have our audience join the dinner table and let's <laughs> let's give us let, why why don't you give us the traditional line? So, what would you defend? What what do you mean when you say you know the traditional the traditional line there? Well, I I think it's here, here's what I would say. Um, you're in Oxford and we we met there recently. I looked up. Uh, on the Oxford City website, and, and it's, I might be wrong on this, but something like 10 million people visit Oxford every year, an extraordinary number of people. Um, what is it they're going to see? It's probably not the engineering building, which is this modernist block um, in, in North Oxford. They're going there because of the beauty of the buildings, the, just the whole feel of the of the city. Um, and pretty much it's any art or architecture or music uh, created, say, prior to, at the very least, uh, you, you might say the Second World War, um, but should we say from the, the 19th century, certainly the 18th century, in the West, the what people were trying to do was produce something beautiful and on the whole, there was a whole tradition as to how to do this. And on and I think pretty much for the most part, those that were good at it succeeded. But the, the test of this is actually pretty simple. It's that most people call it beautiful over an extended period of time. It, there's no great mystery about this. If you ask people what they think about Oxford, most of those 10 million would just say, well, it's a beautiful city. That's why I like it. it, it <laughs> it's it's a simple principle. Um, and on the whole, the traditional uh, values, which can be articulated and taught, it's not just a, a, a gut instinct. That, that's the modern approach to art. Um, that, that There are uh, disciplines and skills and a whole sort of uh, field of understanding, a science of art, if you could call it that, in the, uh, a systematic approach that allows us to, to create things beautifully. And that's what I'm referring to. And uh, it's rooted in this understanding that uh, the cosmos is beautiful and an analysis of what it is we've responding, we've, we respond to in the cosmos, and then we transfer that into the art we make. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, and and you brought up Oxford as an example, which um, it, it strikes me um, going to even some of the oldest um, colleges um, or halls. The in the quads, oftentimes, usually when it comes to student housing, you 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 know you have a you have a beautiful college, beautiful facade, beautiful you know first second quad whatever. But then you have like one building that just sticks out as a sore thumb. It's like a like a brutalist kind of you know apartment building or whatever in the middle. Or then in, I think in, it's St. Anthony's College. You have this weird metal tube that connects two of the you know old kind of nineteenth century buildings. And it's it's so striking how somebody can actually build that. And it's not just built. I mean, it probably costs millions. Um, yes. To make that decision to come up with this, have this approved, and then build it, and not realize that it just doesn't fit. And it's—I don't—I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard for me to find a reason why an architect would do that. That is not just destruction and deconstruction. I don't know. Um, yes, I, I. Well, I think that historically, the reason that they moved away from these traditional ideas of harmony and proportion is because they. Those who were pushing this, so in architecture, it was the Bauhaus, for example, uh, around the 1900s, something like this. They knew that those traditions were rooted in Christian values, traditional values, and they wanted to destroy it. Um, and uh, it took a while for that really to take hold. But should we say by the second, the, the, the period after the Second World War, Artists were no longer taught traditional harmony and proportion. So 
at this point, even if they want to, most of them can't do it. it, it they, it's, it's interesting. I've spoken to architects mm-hmm. who, even if they acknowledge that they want to try and do something beautiful at this point, they will resist the idea that you can teach principles and mathematical proportions that actually enable them to do it. They wouldn't do it in music. People would would accept that you have rules for harmony and counterpoint, but music translated into matter, which is really what architecture is, Mm -hmm. um, they will resist the idea. There is this romantic assumption that somehow my emotions and my gut instincts will just tell me what it is. And you wouldn't do that in any other field of endeavor. It's extraordinary, I think. Well, then let's let's stick with this here. So what, what do you mean by this? Um, and you mentioned this earlier, by this science of art or science of beauty. So, um, so I mean, yeah. is art something scientific? Well, science in the sense of a, a field of knowledge, uh, mm-hmm. so in the, in the broader sense, but in in even you could even equate it with a sort of natural science in that the way the way that um historically uh, the mathematics of harmony and proportion which uh, is you was used by architects so if you have a building of a certain length there are certain you know the height and the width um there are natural dimensions that go with that that it was accepted make it beautiful so where do they come from Well, it begins with a consensus for some sort of standard of beauty. You've got to to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that was the cosmos. In the original Greek, I think cosmos means both order and beauty. We get the words cosmetic from Mm -hmm. from that. Um, And so having accepted that most people find the natural world beautiful, which I would say most people today would accept as well, what you then do is start to analyze what it is about the cosmos that people are responding to. And uh, they would look uh, firstly at uh, what would be the the pinnacle of creation, which is man, uh, mankind, and look at the proportions and describe them mathematically. So they're assuming that it, it's it's a relationship of the parts to each other within the whole. So that's the, the hypothesis. They're accounting for them mathematically. But there is a way to test this, and that is they say that if we use those mathematical ideas within a building uh, and our hypothesis is true, then the building will be beautiful too. How do we test that? Well, you ask people, you say, is this beautiful? Um, because uh, it's, it's actually very simple. And then, um, because there are reasons why there's a subjective element to beauty, you know, we there are cultural reasons, there are other things going on. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the best test as to whether it's beautiful is do a lot of people say that it is over a long period of time. So those buildings that transcend their own time are most likely to be beautiful. We can't prove it categorically, Mm. but we will go with that. And so Oxford, I would say, has passed the test. Those buildings are still considered beautiful. It remains to be seen whether the engineering building will be considered beautiful by future generations, but Given the fact that barely any, even in this generation, think it is, I think it's <laughs> unlikely, possible, but it's unlikely that it'll be considered beautiful in the future. Even though the minute you try and demolish one of those buildings, all the academics come out and it's a listed building and it's a wonderful expression of brutalist, brutalist beauty or something. They, they have these sort of contradictory, so they just assert that it is. Yeah. But if you ask most people, they wouldn't. They wouldn't agree. And the traditional aesthetics begins with a with common sense. What is commonly believed by most people over a long period of time, as uh, Chesterton called it, the democracy of the dead. Is that the phrase he used? Just yeah, I, I think so. Exactly. Yes. Belief. and we call that tradition. That you know, we 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 look to the people of the past and say, what lessons can we learn from them? 
But I find it really interesting when you bring up proportion and 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 just the 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 cosmos, the order of the cosmos, and then the pinnacle of creation or the pinnacle of the cosmos as in the rational being that is man. And what I find really fascinating is when you visit Rome and you see many of the large basilicas, and I'm specifically now thinking of St. Peter's Basilica, uh, you you walk in, and I always had a hard time explaining to people how large the basilica actually is. So um, ironically, given its size, it actually seems much smaller than it is, right? And you bring up all of these comparisons, like the Statue of Liberty fits in it twice uh, and, and things like that. But when you look at, let's say, the, the monument to Victor Emmanuel II, right, which is a more kind of enlightened building style, or then a more stark contrast would be like Nazi architecture or even Mussolini's architecture in, in Eur, um, the buildings look massive. They look gigantic in, comp- in comparison to, um, to, the, to the beholder. And it's such a stark contrast. And I, re- and, I, and I wondered, and in my research, I realized, well, because the Basilica of St. Peter's takes human proportions as a, um, well, as a, as a basis. And so it makes you feel at home. You, you see something human in the building, whereas the, the fascist or the Nazi architecture, it takes, um, it, it, it warps the proportions. So something is, it ought to look bigger because it's the ideology that overpowers the individual, right? And so I always found that really interesting how in the one type of architecture, it is really the human person that is in the center with its harmony, with its bodily embodied harmony. And in the other, it's really just the ideology and the idea behind it that is in the center, which again, for me means, well, there is a an accentuation over the ideology or the let's say the philosophical idea behind it and the actual reality of human life, right? Ha- have you experienced something like this? Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting hearing you describe this. I, I would then look, I, and I think I, I see what you see as well, and and it's alienating the fascist yeah. architecture. It makes you feel small, and it's, it's meant to do so. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that the perfection of that, actually, for me, is in Gothic architecture, mm. which does both. So there is there are details, tiny details that you can go up and have a look at, and, it, and it, on the human scale, it's offering you something. Uh, at you know at the lowest level at the smallest level but then you take a step back and it it has a sense of grandeur and height and it thrusts up thrusts upwards to heaven as well and um the the analogy perhaps is a bit like jacob's ladder in that we have the angels coming down and the angels coming up you know the the, the, the god is coming down to be with us but also He's drawing us up to him in heaven. And there's this, and that's an, an infinite divide in many ways. That, that, but nevertheless, through him, we can cross that. But it is both personal and uh, at the most, or both intimate and grand. And I think that is the ideal. But you see that also in civic architecture, I would say. The Even in high-rise buildings, prior to the Second World War, architects understood what I was describing. So Mm -hmm. if you put a building that's in Manhattan, for example, that goes up very high, they would nevertheless, at street level, give you little details where the shop front was or something that felt personal and small. And then they would design for the grand view at the end of the street, and they would build the these those these harmonious proportions into it in different ways. It's a great skill, and in many ways they're imitating in civic architecture and just sort of commercial architecture much of that Manhattan architecture. I find very beautiful. Actually, it doesn't. High, there's nothing that says that high rise has to be bad. It could, yeah. like anything else, it can be good or bad. Um, <laughs> uh, but they it, they did it with great skill. I think you know the, the turn of the last century. The, the the first what's interesting the first New York Times building mm-hmm. was built according to these principles that I'm describing I don't know something like 1909 and it's a beautiful building then in the 1970s they moved and it's just a a, a, a more conventional post-war high rise it just looks depressing to look at and I often think that it probably reflects the quality of what 
what is written in there. I don't know whether I, I hope I'm not spending <laughs> Times readers and saying that, but uh, it it says something. I think that uh, the quality of the design went down in the seventies, uh, yeah. but they were both high rise buildings in Manhattan. Um, so but yeah. I, I really like those those two elements, the the kind of the the, the grander um, fittingness, right, with its environment, and also with not with the environment, but with the other buildings around it, because that's what an architect also should consider, right? What has yes. been built before, but then the yeah. detail that makes it very personal. See, I it's that's an interesting feature. I I, um, I, I like it because it it, it it encapsulates both the well the, the the macro and the micro in a sense, right? Yes. Very good. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think I think we can we can come up with many more examples of this, but I want to shift uh, the conversation now a little bit to um, something that I have to basically go through in all my classes that I teach, but I think also that in, in personal conversation comes up, and it's this idea of is there objective beauty? Now, how I like to um, think about this, and and you you give me your um, your opinion on this, um, please, but. Um, it seems to me that this idea of objective beauty is something that is already um, relatively modern because it is, well, ultimately Kant that separates the subject from the object. And if you do separate the two, then yes, there is something that you must look for that is beauty in itself, right? Objective beauty. And, and Kant has a great deal to say about okay. this and the principles and, 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 and the judgments that go along with it. So, all right. But... Um, I feel that when people ask the question about objective beauty nowadays, what they're really asking is, well, is there beauty that can be indisputably be called beautiful? Now, you already sort of answered this. You said, well, something could be considered beautiful if it is considered beautiful by a lot of people over an extended period of time. But I'm not super satisfied with this. I want to have a little bit more philosophical answer to this. So what would you answer to the question, you know, is there something that we all can agree is beautiful or even ought to agree is beautiful? What would you say? Um, I think I would look to the natural world here. So there are two possibilities. One is the, just the natural world, just because I think our experience is that most people think it's beautiful. I, I, um, I'm trying to think of anyone I've ever met who can't bear to go into the country and uh, look at a beautiful, you know, look at a view of the mountains or something. That um, I know appreciation of that has changed over centuries, but nevertheless, I think that the natural world has always been considered beautiful. So that could be a standard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the ultimate standard. It's a reflection of the one who created it, but that, but uh, God is invisible. So it, it, that sounds a bit arcane, I think, to most people. Um, and the other thing is that the uh, the rules of musical harmony, I think, could be that you could approach that. So, for example, uh, if you take simple harmonies, the interval of an octave. So on the on the piano, I I, I can play with one finger on my right hand. You know, plonk out notes. So if you go up the white notes on the piano and you go from middle C to C that's higher, I don't think it's a product of culture. I think it's it's there for all cultures that they hear those two notes and they sound the same even though one is pitched higher. Hmm. Um, and then there are other certain fundamental harmonies that sound good almost across all cultures and and typically people would talk about the perfect fourth or the perfect fifth mm -hmm. um there are others which seem to you, you need to seem to learn to grow to appreciate and that could be environment but there but nearly everybody hears an octave as an octave there's nothing mathematically that says that that should be the case that that it seems to be a product of our human perception of it, but nevertheless, we can analyze it after the fact and point to the mathematics. So the the physics uh, science, the, the the scientists would say the the wavelength has doubled and the frequency has halved, or something like that. But that doesn't tell us why we hear it as we hear it. It just it just explain it just observes the properties 
of those things that we hear in that way. Um, and so you, you can uh, use standards like that, maybe. That's what the ancients did. They used the, those as markers uh, for some sort of standard of beauty. Mm -hmm. Very good. Can you, can we define beauty? <laughs> it's, uh, there are definitions, uh, which, and, but I, I, I always think it's difficult because it is one of those things, I think, that we know what, it's easier to say, to recognize something that, that is beautiful than to say what is, what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I've said, it's almost after the fact. We, you know, we observe that we look at the beauty of the cosmos, and th there seems to be a human, re a personal reaction to this. We like it. We we're pleased with it when we see it. Um, and but the a definition that I like is uh, the radiance of being or the splendor of being, mm -hmm. um, which assumes that. Everything that exists is good in its existence. So uh, that it, in some way, if, we're, if it communicates what it is to us, um, that language of splendor or radiance is using the idea of light, I think, but it could be any form of communication of what it is, that somehow we're able to perceive it and get an understanding of what it is and when we do that, we take delight in it. Um, and so it, it's talking about, th therefore, th there's an implication. There's always an observer and an observed object that beauty um, it rests on a sort of an assumption of a relationship between the subject and the object. It's built into it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would say. So some people then object, and I would come up with this um, very often, that um, what, ab what about ugliness? What is ugliness? Can't, can't I see something, know what it is, and then say that it's ugly? And, and the, the traditional way of looking at this is to say that, um, in fact, ugliness is not a thing in itself. It's just that um, when we think something is ugly, it's more that it's just not as beautiful as it ought to be. Mm. It's it's a, it's a uh, they call it a privation of beauty, mm. um, and we might perceive that because first of all, maybe we're not getting all the information about it. We're not fully apprehending what it is, mm. um, or it is distorted in some way, um, so that it's not what it really ought to be. Because when you look at something, you all immediately have a sense of what it is, what it's for, what its purpose is. And we we formulate all these ideas instantly. And when all those are in harmony, we take delight in it and we say it's beautiful. If its purpose is good, and in God's will, world, um, everything has a, a, a good purpose, it just, you know, just sometimes we can misuse it or something. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, very interesting, uh, especially what you say, just going back to that one point about natural beauty and natural beauty being the standard of maybe something that we could consider, you know, that is appreciated or found beautiful by everybody. And um, I've actually made the, a similar experience uh, with the Sistine Chapel. Um, I've been in the Sistine Chapel, you know, touring there and, and giving, giving um, you know, uh, bringing my classes there as well. Probably a couple of hundred times, I'd say 250 times at some point I stopped collecting the tickets, um, but I still have the nice stack somewhere here. Um, and I have never had a single person on my tour who was not touched by it in some way. Now, I would say all of them are touched by its beauty. But then, you know, some of the, you know, some of the, the, the tourists or even students said, oh, this is just like a sign of the, you know, Pope's pompousness or whatever. But mm. even then, when you press them, they cannot really argue that it's not a masterpiece. They look at the ceiling and they're completely in awe. So, so I would say that really, really good art. And I mean, this is obviously a kind of a complex Gesamtkunstwerk in that sense, but and really good art will also not not leave anybody untouched, right? In a similar way that that nature does, right? So, so mm. I just just that as a as a footnote. But um, yeah, I, all right, I, I yeah. add to that that um, 
what's interesting is that although I gave you nature as a the standard, um, as a Christian, of course, we believe that nature is fallen. It's good, but it's not actually as good as it ought to be. And in, in, in its perfection, it would be even greater um, and even more beautiful. And we believe that everything is, you know, that's the, that's the ultimate destiny for, for everything. But the, the, when the, um, traditionally, when the ancients, for example, looked at the world, the question they asked in, in trying to analyze it for its beauty wasn't limited to what is it, but it was, the question was, what ought it to be in the ideal? So they would try, they would look at the patterns and the rhythms of the, the motion of the planets, for example, and uh, convert this into mathematics. But then they would round the numbers up to what they believed was a more harmonious picture. So they started with nature, but e this is even prior, pre Christian. They had this sense that it was pointing to something greater. Um, and then they would base the proportions of their art on that. Now, what that says is that if their hypothesis is correct, that potentially man uh, can create things that are more beautiful than the natural world around us, that the impact of man can raise nature up to something greater. Um, so while the cosmos, the, the beauty of nature is the starting point, it's not the finishing point. And especially as Christians, we believe that God can inspire us He, can, you know, through grace. He can help us to have a vision of something that is greater. Um, the work of man um, doesn't simply imitate. It actually uh, raises, produces something which is a higher form of what they're imitating, potentially, um, which is a grand vision. And I think, you know, what you're describing uh, perhaps reflects something that's even more striking than nature itself. Uh, potentially, should we say it's always possible with the work of Matt? Beautifully said. <laughs> um, David, now I can talk about um, beauty all day long. Um, and uh, but I want to go a little bit from the philosophical down to the very practical. And I'm I'm not an artist. I'm not uh, unfortunately, I mean, I, I lack some of the skill. I did some drawing in the past, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but you are an active artist, and you actually have a very interesting project um, that you're involved with, um, which is trying to bring back the classical and traditional formation of artists, um, which yes. is is a definite deficit in, in our day and age. So can you tell us a little bit about that? You mentioned something of a workshop, but maybe uh, give us a little bit more detail here. What what can what what do people have to imagine? Right. So the, the project is called the Chichester Workshop of Liturgical Art. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been started by my old icon painting teacher, an Orthodox Christian called Aidan Hart. And he he has two of his star pupils, uh, and I'm not one of them. I'm I'm somebody who's working on the on, uh, involved in trying to promote this. Mm -hmm. um, but one of them is called Martin Earl. He's Catholic. Another one is called Jim Blackstone. He is Anglican, mm -hmm. so Protestant, and they have started a workshop. So what they uh, do is paint in the iconographic style, but mm -hmm. their focus is on liturgical art, mm -hmm. and they do so in a way that, um, shall we say, connects to the, the modern mind. So the, the, they understand how to apply what they've learned about this tradition, um, it, how to do that in such a way that it connects with people today. So uh, it's a living tradition. So it has a sense of a modern look, but without contravening the principles of the tradition. They then will take commissions and will uh, take on apprentices, very high quality students who will work on those commissions. And so Martin, for example, he can fresco a church from floor to ceiling. I've seen the work that he's done. It's wonderful. And if you wanted to characterize it, I would say that they're like modern versions of Giotto. It, it has that look to it. It's it's certainly relatable in terms of its sort of naturalistic form, but it's very obviously sacred as well. It's of, of another world. Um, 
And they are training people to the highest level through the projects that they're actually working on in churches. And they can do mosaic, fresco, uh, panel iconography, um, and they understand the theology behind it. And that they're interested in, and this is where I'm what really interests me, in taking on people of the very highest level who need what you might call the, the postdoc training. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a young American guy um, called Ander Sharbach who comes from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. He has just uh, been working with them, and he has done something like six years training in the academic method. He is a highly competent artist, but he knows that he needs that final formation in how to direct those skills in the service of God in liturgical art. So he has been working with them as an apprentice. Now, what I like about this is that he's at the level where when he's finished, he will be able to come back to the United States where I'm, I am now and he will be able to take commissions and teach others in that way. So they become multipliers then at the highest level. It, it, they're teaching people not just about the tradition, but how to pass on the tradition. Mm. And so they're creating a, a, a structure which I hope really will reestablish the tradition. But at the core of it, and you just have to look at the arts to um to appreciate it i would say the the quality of the art is good enough that this is worth pushing i i've been looking at artists for many years and in the context of liturgical art i i haven't seen a project like this that i've been prepared to throw my weight behind wholeheartedly to the degree that i do with this i honestly think that this offers an opportunity to transfer transform the, the art that we see in our churches. And it really is of the quality. You talked about going into the Sistine Chapel and it takes your breath away. Martin's work, for example, his frescoes, I think people will be looking at his work in 500 years' time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think he's that good. And the, and Aidan and Jim are at the highest level as well. Aidan, of course, is the teacher of us all. He's uh, master iconographer, but I think I think we have something that's really worth building on here, and so that's what that's what I'm involved with. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, you can be sure that uh, after this interview, I'll be I'll be on Google looking at the pictures. <laughs> um, now your your beautiful book here, the way way of beauty. Um, that I've um, that I've studied um, just a little bit. Um, wants to introduce people to, well, that, the way of beauty. And this is kind of what I want to end with. And um, since we are, you know, doing the reality check, well, um, for our listeners and the viewers, if they want to grow in the appreciation of beauty, if they want to make beauty more a part of their lives on a day to, mm -hmm. in a day-to-day -day kind of way, um, what would you um, encourage them to do? What would you suggest they should start with um, to begin on that path towards beauty? I would say start praying with beauty pray and praying beautifully. Uh, that's the, it, the forms that are associated with our prayer and worship. When we effectively, we opened ourselves up in the most profound way to accept God's love and to offer it back to him, um, if the forms that are connected with our worship and our prayer are in harmony with that, then they impress themselves upon our soul in a deep way. And that will transform us. And then what happens is we take that out into the world and we start to contribute gracefully, beautifully to the world around us. How can you do that um, practically? I would recommend that you get an icon corner in the home, an image corner, beautiful art that, that you feel works well with your prayer. Pray the Psalms, pray that liturgically. Um, the imagery in the language of the Psalms is, is um, stimulating the imagination as much as the form of the music. If we're chanting, try and chant it. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful art that you have. Um, and you can do that with your family, and that it 
it is a transforming experience. I would say incrementally, but nevertheless perceptibly. Um, it affects your your taste and what you gravitate towards and how you, um, just your, the way that you do things, even quite mundane things will be affected by this. My hope is, I, I always recommend that people do this in the home because we have control over that. And I, I'm not one of, you know, there's a lot of ugly art in churches, as we know, but I don't like wagging my fingers at the priests. Everyone's doing the best they can on the whole. And, you know, they've got limited resources, limited formation. But if people are doing this, then I, my, what I'm hoping for is that they then might go into the parish and say, look, this is what... Um, I've been praying within the home. Could we have art that corresponds to this for the mass and in the church? And if enough people do that, um, and they're prepared to put them, you know, reach into their pockets too collectively, which is amazing how that can uh, accumulate. If many people do that, we could actually have a from the grassroots up, actually transform the culture of faith that way. I think. Yeah. Very, very beautiful. Good. Well, let's start with that. Christmas is coming up, so I think that'll be the best time um, to add a little bit more prayer and a little bit more beauty to our lives. So um, so um, let's begin with that right away, shall we? Well, thank you, David. This was uh, really excellent. I, I feel like we've only really talked about half of the things that I wanted to talk with you about. So I hope that uh, we'll chat again um, off camera and on camera. Um, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your time. Um, good luck with all of your endeavors. And uh, well, till the next time. Thank you. It was terrific. Thank you very much.